the 10th of February 1931, Lord Irwin, the Viceroy of India, unveiled four red stone columns on Raisena Hill. These columns, gifts from the British Empire's four dominions, Canada, Australia, South Africa and New Zealand, were gestures of friendship and unity, and emphasised India's place within the family of nations that made up the empire. With this ceremony, the first among many, the Viceroy formally inaugurated New Delhi as the new capital of India. Nearly 20 years before, at the Delhi Darbar in 1911, King George V announced the shifting of India's capital from Calcutta to Delhi. The main reason for the move was to enable the government to escape the uncomfortable political atmosphere of Calcutta marked by violent demonstrations of nationalist sentiment since Lord Curzon's 1905 partition of Bengal. And Delhi seemed like the perfect alternative. First, it would give the government a more central seat of power vis-à-vis -vis the regional, coastal locations of Bombay, Calcutta, Madras and Karachi. Second, it had a royal appeal as it had already served as a capital for many centuries to different empires, including the Mughals. The transfer also provided an opportunity to create a new form of colonial architecture that portrayed the power and permanence of the British Empire. The capital was to be ready within four years after the foundation stone was laid in 1911. But things didn't go as planned. The First World War broke out and it imposed stringent funding constraints along with lack of labour. But a couple of years after the end of the war, the plan for the new capital was back on the table. Edwin Lutyens and Herbert Baker were chosen as its chief architects and they selected the southern plains beyond the old walled city of Shah Jahanabad as their site. The new colonial architecture was strongly influenced by many European buildings. But it also borrowed elements from the Indian monuments thanks to the insistence of then Viceroy Lord Hardinge who wanted to make sure that these buildings represented the country that they were part of. Once the plan was sanctioned, the contract of building the city was assigned to Indian contractors like Sobha Singh and Sujan Singh. The rocky hills were blasted and land leveled to accommodate the Viceroy's house and the twin secretariat buildings. Rai Sena Hill along with the council house became the power corridor of the Indian subcontinent. The new capital was formally inaugurated in 1931 through a series of ceremonies. The last of these was the unveiling of the All India War Memorial or India Gate as we know it today on the 12th of February 1930. It was built to commemorate the Indians who died in the First World War and the Afghan Wars. However, the inauguration failed to make a mark. The Times London reported, it would be idle to pretend that the ceremony had any popular support. The attendance was confined entirely to those admitted by invitation. According to the Tribune, published from Lahore, the function was deliberately designed to show the white man's superiority and to emphasize that India could do well within the British Empire and not to talk of independence. This was because the news of the inauguration was overshadowed by the Roundtable Conference which took place in London around the same time to chart the course of India's self-governance. In the two decades that it took to build the new capital, the fate of the British Empire itself had changed. While it was an all-powerful empire in 1911, by 1931 it was pretty much clear that a transition of power was imminent. As historian and author Thomas Metcalfe quite rightly pointed out, the new capital 
for all the grandeur of its conception, was to mark the beginning of the end.